so most of you guys would know that um, we'll be going through the Awaken series, um, which has been really, really amazing, really, really epic. Um, uh, we had Pastor Honest start us out. We actually we had we had the the guys that planted churches start us off uh, over the weekends, and then Pastor Honest was done Sunday, um, just to anchor us from the Sunday. And then we had Pastor Bat as well. And then we also this morning we also have a good friend of the church, um, someone that has come here before um, to bless us with the word. And man, Pastor Honest, I think Pastor Honest said we. We are a country um, that is blessed with good preachers, you know, good, faithful men that can unpack God's word in a really, really faithful way. And uh, I'm really proud to call this brother up here because I've heard him preach in the past in previous churches. Come. This is uh, Pastor Clayton. Um, man, uh, man, you're such a faithful brother. Uh, and I know that this morning you will bless us, uh, even just the story on the background, what's happening with your family. I know you, you're not ready to share that story. That's great. But when you are ready to share that testimony, man, we are, we are excited. Uh, but more than that, I know that we'll get a feel of that as you preach to us, as you share the word. But more than that, brother, can I pray for you? Yeah. Um, dear Lord, um, once again, we are thankful uh, that you have blessed us um, with people that can unpack the word in a faithful way, uh, people who can unpack the way in a way that shows conviction, uh, people that can unpack the word in a way that shows, Lord, they are a conduit that you speak through them. And so, Lord, I pray that you breathe a gentle fire through Clayton. And I pray, Lord, that uh, whatever he has to say, Lord, uh, it's not from him, it's from me, it's from you, Lord. And I pray, Lord Jesus, that you would give us ears to hear, Lord, and eyes to see. And I pray, Lord, that you would give us uh, a taste of the holy as he speaks your word, uh, that it would be transformative, that it would work through us, Lord. And that, Lord, once again, um, we'll leave this place just having had an encounter with you. And so, Lord, once again, uh, breathe, speak, impact through my brother here. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Bless us, brother. Thank you. Rooted Fellowship, I greet you in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. It's wonderful to be here. Thank you for expending so much of your resources to get me here. It's thoroughly appreciated, and I certainly hope it will prove worth the investment. Please turn with me in your Bibles to Genesis. Genesis chapter 3. We'll read the entire chapter. Genesis chapter 3, verse 1, and I'm reading from the English Standard Version. Now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God actually say you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden. Neither shall you touch it lest you die. But the serpent said to the woman, you shall not surely die. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. And she also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate. Then the eyes of both were opened and they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loincloths. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man and said to him, where are you? And he said, I heard the sound of you in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. He said, who told you that you were naked? 
Have you eaten of the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? The man said, The woman whom you gave to be with me, she gave me fruit of the tree, and I ate. And the Lord God said to the woman, What is this that you have done? The woman said, The serpent deceived me, and I ate. The Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, cursed are you above all livestock and above all beasts of the field. On your belly you shall go, and dust you shall eat all the days of your life. I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your offspring and her offspring, and shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. To the woman he said, I will surely multiply your pain in childbearing. In pain you shall bring forth children. Your desire shall be for your husband, and he shall rule over you. And Adam said, and to Adam he said, Because you have listened to the voice of your wife, and have eaten of the tree of which I commanded you, you shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground because of you. In pain you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you, and you shall eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your face you shall eat bread till you return to the ground, for out of it you were taken, for you are dust, and to dust you shall return. The man called his wife's name Eve, because she was the mother of all living. And the Lord God made for Adam and for his wife garments of skins and clothed them. Then the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become like one of us in knowing good and evil. Now, lest he reach out his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever. Therefore, the Lord God sent him out from the garden of Eden to work the ground from which he was taken. He drove out the man, and at the east of the garden of Eden, he placed the cherubim and a flaming sword that turned every way to guard the way to the tree of life. Amen. At the outset of Christ's ministry, he calls the disciples with the following words. Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Ironically, the term Christian implies you are like Christ. You are Christ-like. Following him, we become fishers of men. Conversely, those who do not fish for men are not likely followers of Christ. Are you a disciple of Jesus? Are you his follower? For such a person would exhibit his character. And what is that character? I think the passage that is before us quite explicitly displays that character of God. I deem it foundational in disclosing aspects of God's character. For it's when you are being abused, mistreated, and maligned that the truth about you is disclosed. This is not so. It's when you are in difficult circumstances and when people are mistreating you, when people are abusing you, that your character is displayed in your response to that abuse. And God, in this text is being severely mistreated and maligned. His character is being impugned. His gracious intent is being misrepresented as a selfish and sinister deprival of a good thing. He withholds a good thing is the accusation that is made against a good God. He's being portrayed as a liar, And is being taken for one who is untrustworthy. And it is in the midst of such vile mistreatment that his character is disclosed most explicitly. How he responds to this egregious act. This vile sin against him shows you and I who our God really is. And his response is heart-rending. 
the word of God says, And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. Verse 9, But the Lord God called to the man and said to him, Where are you? I submit to you that our God is a God who seeks the lost. The Lord God called to the man, the man who was not where he ought to have been. Did he need to call out to Adam? He knew precisely where Adam and Eve were hiding. He is the all-knowing, all-seeing God. He didn't need the information. He's displaying the fact that there is disrepair, that there is a breach that has come in between you and me. Where are you? You are not where you belong. You have gone away from home. You have gone away from my presence. Where are you? This breach of separation has been inserted. And Adam is rightfully afraid because the holiness of God demands that you pay the ultimate price for sinning against the ultimate individual. Consider the directionality. Here you have God going to the one who has sinned against him. The innocent goes to the insolent. We have never sought him. He seeks us. The one who incurs the wrong, absorbs the injury, and seeks the infidel. The victim of such flagrant abuse wants to be reconciled to the villain, you And me. The New Testament is littered with examples of this trait of God. Luke chapter 15, the parable of the lost sheep. What does our God and Father do? How is he being described? He's being described as the one who leaves the 99 who are safe. And he runs after the one who is lost. He pursues the lost. He seeks after the one who is wandering He goes after the one who is at risk of being mauled away from the safety of the presence of the shepherd, away from the safety of the communion of the other sheep. He goes and runs after those. The ultimate shepherd runs, leaves the 99, seeks the one lost sheep. The parable of the lost coin. The the silver coin is lost. The lady turns up the house, sweeps until she finds that lost coin. God is in the business of upending the household until he finds what he has lost. He's in the business of seeking out the lost the parable the prodigal son god is in the business of making a fool of himself if need be so that you might be reconciled to him he girds up his loins in that portion of scripture in that context no senior man no patriarch of the household runs after a child much less a child that has said i wish you were dead give me my inheritance thank you very much runs off and squanders that inheritance lives a life that is utterly utterly devoid of any of the morals that he might have been taught and then comes back but that father is standing looking on the horizon and when he sees something that looks remotely clear Close to his child, he girds up his loins, runs. Scripture says he falls on the neck of that child. I love you. You're home. You're here. And we have a great feast together. And the ultimate example of this character trait of God. The ultimate example is God's pursuit of the lost in Christ Jesus. That Savior who came down from heaven's glory, the magnificence of heaven, 
and condescends in the most magnificent condescension. He brings himself and takes upon him the form of a human being, a creature that he has fashioned his very self and subjects himself to the abuse and some of the difficulty and strife that is among these individuals so that he might reconcile us to God through his death and resurrection. I submit to you that God seeks the lost. I submit to you that this portion of scripture reveals to you and me that God is a missionary. And when he calls you to participate in the Great Commission, he's not calling you to something he hasn't done himself. No, he's calling you to participate in work he has been doing since time began. And the question remains, are you on mission with God? Secondly, he responds by seeking out Adam and Eve calling them and saying, where are you? But then goes beyond that and does something even more marvelous. After the sin is brought to light, God preaches the gospel yeah. and proclaims the unraveling of this evil deed and its consequences. He responds to this sin, this breach between God and man, the discord between husband and wife, a representation of the discord among all humankind. He responds to this brokenness that has entered this world by preaching the gospel and pointing to Christ. Genesis chapter 3.15 says, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. I think you can agree with me. It's a very significant difference between bruising someone's heel and bruising someone's head. And that is the nature of the victory that shall be through Jesus Christ. And so he preaches the gospel. And in theological terms, this text, Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, is known as the Proto-Evangelion, the first occurrence of the gospel. And that is how God responds to sin in this world, by preaching the gospel, by proclaiming good news. When he was entitled to utterly destroy us right there and then, bring an end to all creation because we have sinned against God, it was what was our due. He instead preaches the good news. He proclaims the gospel. It doesn't matter how deep your insolence and rebellion against God goes. This morning, he's preaching the gospel to you and saying, will you come? Will you set your hope upon Christ Jesus? Will you set your hope upon him who will come and bring an end to this enmity? Who has brought an end to this enmity? God is a preacher. He preached it first and we merely follow his example preach the gospel in season and out of season we do the work of evangelists enduring hardship because all of our hope is caught up in Christ yeah. all of our hope all of our dreams are satisfied in Jesus I find it fascinating that God in response to this sin, comes and preaches the gospel and pins the hope of the world on Christ, alluding, of course, to the ultimate death of the Lord Jesus Christ and his ultimate victory over Satan. This before questions of politics and hierarchy. This before questions of economics you will see he addresses there the woman and this man shall rule over you. And then the question of economics. I think that uh, economically speaking, when God curses the ground, that this is the introduction of competition through a simple supply deficiency. The supply is not going to match the demand. 
I'm cursing the ground right now. And competition comes into existence. And as a result of that, we are striving with one another constantly, jostling for resources. And so before addressing issues of uh, hierarchy, issues of authority, issues of power and power differentials, and before addressing issues of economic systems, etc., he preaches and proclaims the gospel. They are important enough to be addressed by God, but mark and note that they are subservient to his proclamation of the gospel. To my mind, no political ideology, no economic system, no philosophy of the ages has the power to save. For this reason, Paul says, I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God unto salvation. There is no other power by which we are saved. There is no other name given under heaven by which man can be saved except the name of Jesus. I heard someone say in an interview on YouTube that America is the hope of the world. I apologize to any Americans in the audience this morning. That title belongs to Jesus. He is the hope of the world. To my mind, there is only one mechanism of societal transformation. And it emanates from a transformed life. It is impossible for the gospel not to have a societal impact. And I think this is sometimes where we get it wrong, is that we don't see the gospel as translating into what happens in society. I tell you one thing for certain, that when you are under the influence of the gospel, you love justice. You pursue mercy. And that and in of itself is already some societal impact. The moment you speak out against abortion, on the basis of what? On the basis of God's justice, on the basis of God's word, you are beginning to influence society and have societal impact. And I'm tired of being accused of being soft on the gospel because I anticipate a societal change. It's precisely because I am so hard on the gospel that I think it should demand a change in how we live and a change in society and a change in the norms that we have grown so accustomed to. If we are the people of God, if his Holy Spirit truly does dwell in us, If his gospel, his word is truly the power of God unto salvation, by this I mean reconciliation with God as well as reconciliation with our fellow fellow man, then surely the gospel, the gospel must impact our lives. And so God is setting our hope, not just our hope for uh, eternal salvation, but he's setting our hope on even temporary salvation reconciliation in this in south africa on the african continent globally he's setting our hope where on jesus christ does not mean that we will not address those issues they certainly will be it is the natural outcome of a life under the influence of the gospel of god the church is the custodian of the remedy for spiritual malady and social ill it's not one or the other it's both and you and i have this treasure in earthen vessels this treasure that upended the world we have the church represented in every country of the world at this juncture god is doing that God is at work. He is busy showing his kingdom, not just to come, but in the here and now as well. Christ epitomizes God's proclamation of the good news. When you hear the angels come and they say to the shepherds, fear no more. 
Adam's response was right. He was right to be afraid of a holy God. But those angels come and preach on that night when the Savior is born. And they say, fear no more. We bring you tidings of great joy. The fear is removed because the wrath is gone. Our Savior has come. And so God sets our hope on Christ. He preaches the gospel. And my question to you is, are you a follower of Jesus Christ? You would be like him if you were. Are your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel? Finally, In verse 20, God graciously comes and covers their shame. It says, the man called his wife, wife's name Eve because she was the mother of all living. Sorry, verse 21. And the Lord God made for Adam and for his wife garments of skins and clothed them. You remember when they had sinned initially, they had knitted for themselves fig leaves very inadequate way of covering their shame, God comes and he puts his hand to the innocent. The skins didn't come from nowhere. This is the institution of the sacrificial system where he puts his hand to the innocent and now covers them with those skins. He makes atonement for their sin and covers them. I submit to you, our God is a missionary. I submit to you that he seeks the lost. He sets our hope on Christ. And I submit to you that God sacrifices himself. Putting his hand to the innocent would not be the last time he would do this. He was foreshadowing what is going to be required for your sin to be taken as far as the east is away from the west. He was foreshadowing what was necessary, what would be demanded to undo what had transpired in the Garden of Eden. He puts his hand to the innocent as he would put his hand to the innocent savior make him who knew no sin to be sin for us so that you and I might become the righteousness of God he clothes us I don't care how deep your shame goes his blood is enough he covers your and my shame. You've got no reason to be ashamed any longer. Those days are gone. His blood has come. He covers my sin. And you're clean before him, not on the basis of what you have done. You will find that your own efforts will always be inadequate. They will be nothing but fig leaves sewn together until you surrender and submit to the way that he has made so that you might be clean before him. He graciously covers their sin. The Abrahamic covenant, you see God puts Abraham into a deep sleep. And then there are two elements that walk through the, the trail of blood, animals on either side. Abraham is asleep. This is something he's not undertaking by himself. This is God saying, I will do. Amen. The two parties in a covenant are present. It's just not you. It's all God. It's all God. That's what he does. It's all God. He does that for you and he does that for me. Abraham is not present when this transaction takes place. Because it's a transaction taking place within the Godhead. Remember the incident of Abraham and Isaac. Takes Isaac up to be offered up for him. Interesting. 
that he spares Abraham the loss of his son on that day. But he would not spare himself. A day would come where he would flay his own son. Where he would bruise him. Where he would pour his wrath out upon him. How excruciating a suffering for the one and only true God to bestow upon the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And it was for you and it is for me. Interesting that on that day he spares Isaac, the son of Abraham, but he would not spare his only begotten son. Christ lays down his life. He lays down his life for you and for me. The character of God in this instance is quite clear. It's quite plain to me. He seeks the lost. He wants to be reconciled to us. He proclaims the gospel and sets our hope on the only Savior, Jesus Christ, and then sacrifices his own life. But that is not the end of the story. He takes it up again. He takes it up again. And now he calls you to lay down your life, your dreams, your desires, and align them with his. Romans 10, 12 says, For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. For the same Lord is Lord of all, bestowing his riches on all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. How then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in him of whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? And how are they to preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. The Lord Jesus Christ invites you to participate with him in the ministry of reconciling the lost to God. But you must lay down your life. To be like the Father in heaven who seeks the lost and sets the hope of the world on Christ, you must surrender yourself as a living sacrifice. And only in laying down your life in this way do they get to hear. Have you laid down your life? Have you laid down your aspirations for the future? Have you laid down your plans that you have so carefully laid out, I say to you, wake up. Your God seeks the lost, proclaims the gospel and lays down his life. I, I urge you to wake up. You are dreaming of, of retirement when you could know him by sharing in his sufferings, by filling up in your bodies the sufferings that are lacking in Christ's. Would you wake up, oh dreamer, you dream of the car, you dream of the house, you dream of the illusion of safety, you dream of the wife, you dream of the husband. You're inebriated with the cares of this life and not the concerns of God. He is interested in seeking the lost. Yeah. Lay down your life that you may take it up again in glory. You rob yourself of this journey, this journey, this adventure with God, trusting him and seeing where he is at work and watching him provide for what he is busy doing in this world because you sit and are satisfied with a life working only so that you may retire in relative peace and you forsake the greatest joy of them all because Christ for the joy set before him for the joy set before him endured yes the hardship of the cross are you so kind my brother thank you I didn't mean to 
mess on your microphone. <laughs> Sorry to whoever uses this one after this. <laughs> I want to remind you, I've taken up so much of your time. I want to remind you, Rooted, that you only have now. What do I mean by that? Obviously, we're living with the parousia in mind. We're living with the end in mind, right? Do you realize that faith in its present form won't be required in the then? Do you realize that risk will not exist in its present form like it will then? You don't lose risking for the kingdom. You only fail forward. The only person who's missing out on knowing God, knowing how he works, is the one who is not willing to be like him, even sharing in his sufferings in the here and in the now, who left his home in glory, who left his splendor in heaven to come and dwell among us. Stop dreaming. Wake up. God wants to reach the lost and he wants to use you. He wants you to participate and see his glory, see his magnificence. That you might worship him and glorify him for what he is busy doing in his world. You get to know him in ways those who don't risk for his glory will never know him. Because you exert faith. And whose reputation is on the line anyway? It's not your reputation. You can look silly if you want to. But God has said, do it. It's his reputation on the line. Lauren and I are persuaded that the Lord is telling us to leave lucrative jobs. Myself as a dean of administration at Cape Town Baptist Seminary. My wife as a medical doctor. Leave a majority Christian world to go and serve in a minority Christian world. Tired of the inequity that exists in God's world. We quibble over the... Pardon me, this is free of charge. Um, we quibble over the finer details of theology, which I realize are important conversations to have. But in the context of the fact that there are people who don't know Jesus as Lord, I would say that is the more urgent need, and that is the more important thing for us, the people of God, to be devoting energy to. There are brothers and sisters who are called to stay and are called to sort out issues of the eternal subordination of Jesus Christ or the eternal uh, procession of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's fine. Y'all go and have that conversation. But in the context of people who don't know Jesus as Savior, three million some odd gods that they worship, the idols are mighty colossus, bigger than this building itself, standing in Mauritius. In a majority Hindu state. The only majority Hindu nation on the African continent. Lauren and I are persuaded we are to go. And we'll go to Mauritius and there we will serve. Persuaded that the Lord has so moved us. We only have now. People are looking at me and going, this is really dumb. This is absolutely stupid. And I agree, financially, it's utter suicide. Who would want to do something like this? But my children are not mine. They are God's. I am not mine. I am God's. I will leave to Him the bread that comes on my children's table. I'll trust Him with that. It's his reputation on the line. I argue he is trustworthy. You only have now. When all of this is done, what are you going to say of yourself? You never risked for the kingdom. You never risked for God's glory. Take a risk. For goodness sake, trust God. I know. I've taken so much of your time. I'm going to conclude with these thoughts. Yao Perby, Dr. Yao Perby said something interesting. He said, since 2018, Africa has more Christians on it than any other continent in the world. 
soon we will have more Christians on this continent than numerous continents put together. We are no longer going to be a nation or a country or a continent that receives missionaries, but should be responsible for sending Christianity to the world. What is the quality and caliber of that ministry that will leave our shores of the African continent to go to the rest of the world? Yao Perbi said that um, we've got the interesting dynamic right now that certain countries are closed, but they are inviting African Christian students to come and study whatever they want to study in those closed countries. Muslim countries, communist countries. And here's the interesting thing. They are even footing the bill. <laughs> All expenses paid, you come. Are you on mission with God? Because then that would represent, that would represent an opportunity to be like your father in heaven, seeking the lost, proclaiming the good news, and embodying the gospel by laying your life down. God bless you. Gracious God and eternal heavenly father, we thank you for this incredible example, and not just an example, but this incredible calling. You call us to be alert, awake to what you are doing in this world. You are doing it with or without us. And you're calling us to partner with you so that we may come to know you, so that we may walk with you, so that we may participate in the blessing of being in my father's business, of reconciling a lost world to our God and Savior. Thank you for it. Help us to obey in Jesus' name. Amen.